You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Well, good morning. I really feel like we should be listening to Jim this morning, but that's just not the way the Lord has got it lined up, is it? And uh, I do appreciate being here again, being able to speak again this morning, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, at the expense of Jim's arm, I'm sorry, or his shoulder, <laughs> and, but we're glad to see he is with us this morning and able to give, uh, be here, and uh, hopefully he's feeling better and without too much uh, drugs. <laughs> okay, let's let's begin this morning. Actually, I would rather talk about the Manhui people, people that we spent so many years with, but God's got us looking at Galatians, and we'll give you just a little bit of an insight of some of the translation a little bit here. But let's look at Galatians. We read already, Jim read for us Acts, and we're going to be th- going back and forth a little bit between the, uh, that chapter and this first chapter of Galatians this morning. So let's just read first Galatians 1, Galatians chapter 1, verses 11, verses 11, down to the end of the passage to verse 24. And he says this, he says, For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you've heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh or blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. That's a long sentence. (laughs) Okay, to go on. And then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, or Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, Now in what I'm writing to you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith, which he once tried to destroy. And they were glorifying God because of me. Let's just ask the Lord to guide us here this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this passage. Thank you for... Uh, Paul and uh, how he spent so much time writing these books that we have today to enjoy, to to get a picture of you and what happened. And we thank you, Lord, that it was not all about Paul, that it was about yourself. We pray, too, that as we read this, we'll see that you are the one to be glorified always. Thank you so much in your name. Amen. Do you ever... uh, pick up a book and begin to read it, and, and then you uh, flip over to the end of it. You've got to read the end of the book, because you've got to find out, is this really worth reading, this book? And so you go there and you read the end first before you go back. Or, well, my wife loves to do this. Nancy loves to, to read a book at the end and, and then go in and read it to see if she really wants to read it, and I, I can understand that a little bit. Or have you ever started watching a movie uh, and you decide to, to, to watch the very end first? Uh, to see if you want to watch the entire movie. I think some of us do that as well. And this morning, I'd like to kind of do that as well with our passage this morning. I'd like to to go to the very end of where we've read. This is verse 24. And make some comments there first before we dive into the rest of this. Paul states there in verse 24, as we just read, and they were glorifying God because of me. And I believe that Paul was kind of summarizing what had been happened, what had happened everything up to that point in his life, uh, that only God gets the glory for everything that was happening. God should always get the glory, isn't it, for whatever we do. In the context of this verse, 
we find that the Judean Christians all over Judea had heard about Paul and they were giving God the glory for what had happened. Not Paul. They weren't praising Paul. They were praising the Lord. So God was getting the glory. And, and the reason I, I wanted to start there was because I, got, I kind of remind, it kind of reminds me of, of, of myself and, and my wife and our work down in Paraguay. But it was what God accomplished all those years that we spent there in our work and ministry. It wasn't, it wasn't us. It wasn't, it's, and it's not that I, I can say I'm like Paul, because believe me, I'm not. I would never be able to have kept up with him. Uh, the extremely hard uh, life that he lived, we've had it easy compared to that. But, but I do know this, that the Manhui believers continually praise God and give him the glory for the things that have happened there because of what Nancy and I and our teammates accomplished in their lives. And, and there's many believers also in churches around the world, around uh, the United States, including this one here. When they heard of what God had done, they also have praised God and they continue to do so. So God is honored and God is glorified. We're not. God is. Uh, because of this small community of, of Manhui people there in Paraguay, in this tiny little corner of this world, a very small group of people in a tiny corner of the world, uh, have heard the gospel. There's believers. There's a church established. There's the, the New Testament and many of the Old Testament passages translated into their language. They can hear, read it from themselves in their own language and understand it. And the church is growing. In fact, just as a side issue, I just got word a couple of days ago from our son who's back down there. Uh, the church that we had built years ago for these people, the building, not the people, but the building, uh, we built that, and they helped us build it, and it kind of fell down because it wasn't very, very strong. And so uh, some folk uh, it, around the United States have offered money to rebuild that, at least provide the, the materials, and the monoe themselves will build it. So we just got the word that they're, they've gotten the money now, and they're, they're going ahead and starting to lay the bricks for that, for that building. So God continues to get the glory. He's the one that provided it. Um, so anyway, this people the light. And Satan's darkness has been pushed back out of that corner just a little bit. And and, and like I said, it wasn't us. It wasn't, it's not about us. It never was. We absolutely cannot take the credit for that. It was God who did it. Only as us acting as his servants and his messengers. And I'm just thankful for what we were able to do, but to let God get the glory for that. And the Manui people like Paul and, and can say, uh, they're glorifying God because of us. So that's that's the end of the story. So let's go now to the, where we are. Uh, I'm going to kind of do some review because it's been since August since I spoke. So I just kind of uh, do a, a few things. There was the last time I spoke, it was in August, so it's been quite a while. And we were talking about two different things. We we're talking about uh, Paul's defense of a pure and simple gospel. And that gospel was the fact that it's by faith by grace through faith in God alone. And, and Paul was defending that because there were some problems with the Galatians and their understanding. So we looked at that and we also saw that he, Paul defended himself as well, his apostleship. And we'll find out why. I mentioned before that it was, I've read and I've reread these first two chapters of Galatians. And, and, and I often wonder, why did Paul go into so much detail about his apostleship? Why did he do that? And as, as we think about the background of this book, uh, we have to go back to the book of Acts, and that's why we read in Acts this morning. Uh, in the book of Acts, we're told by Luke how these legalistic Jews that knew of Paul, they, they detested him. And they, even to the point of following right behind him into the churches that he had established. In Galatia, the churches in Galatia were, were, were also where they went, and they, they, their purpose was to stir up the, the, the new believers and cause them to question whether Paul was really authentic or not. And they also wanted to try and convince the believers that there was more to it. It wasn't just faith. Uh, Paul had corrupted it by just saying it was faith. He'd thrown out all the, all the rules and all the laws, and, and they didn't like that at all. And uh, so they said that Paul's message was corrupted, and it was his own invention. And it appears that, that some of these believers in Galatia had actually begun to believe that. Uh, what they were saying. And this is why we can, we can see this, we conclude this, because of what Paul says to the believers there in, in verse 6 of this first chapter, 
He says, I am amazed, he said, that that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel because they were listening to this gospel of works. So this is why Paul was going into so much detail and so much of his defense, especially to show these believers that the gospel was not according to man's logic, uh, as we looked at last time I spoke, because if his gospel had been according to man and according to man's reasoning and logic, then it would have included works because that's, we saw that the last time I spoke, Paul would have to have preached that a man needs to conform at least to circumcision, at least the, and the Mosaic traditions and to keep the, the 10 commandments as well as believe in Jesus Christ in order for God to save him. And, and that, that has carried on all down through the generations and, and years because even today, there's many churches that, that say that it's not, that, that it's our, our works, what we do, that shows our faith. And so it's, they're depending on works rather than faith, and rather than great, the grace of God. So this is why Paul had to go into, into so much detail. We're told in Galatians verses 11 and 12 that Jesus alone had given him the message. That was where we were also. And we noted that it, this wasn't Paul's creation. He doesn't state in those verses, what, what the gospel message is. We have to go all the way to chapter 2 and verse 16. But we do find there that Paul does say that it's all about what Christ has done. Man is not made righteous, he says, uh, before God by works, but simply by faith alone in the finished work of Christ. It's the finished work of Christ. And we'll get to that eventually down the road. We're not going to actually go into that today any more than that. But I just wanted to, to just remind us that this is what the true gospel message is. It's not about works at all. And it was not Paul's idea either. We also looked last time from verses 13 to 15. We saw how Paul gave this detailed account of his uh, being a legalistic Pharisee, one who was very zealous, and one who uh, was, it was all about the traditions of the Jews. And because of this, he'd been doing a tremendous amount of work eradicating as many of the Christians those that followed the way of Jesus of Nazareth, because this was, was what Paul, I thought, was corruption at first. And we noted how he gave this account, uh, also this whole account of his past, to show that he couldn't have been converted on his own. He had heard the gospel many times, probably, from these Christians, and that's why he was persecuting them, because it was against, against what he believed was true. And so then this complete about-face, he says, was... Where he says there in verse the end, they start in verse fifteen. But he says, but when God, when God did, and that's where we left off the last in the last time we spoke. This was Paul's best defense of being a true apostle because it was God that had done it. It was nothing about what he had done or or, or had uh, decided to believe in. God was responsible for it. So now let's go forward today. <clears throat> there's there's three. These are more details, by the way, of, of Paul's defense. And we're going to look at three different things this morning. We're going to look at God's work, what God did. We're going to look at Paul's travels, where he went. And we're going to look at the Jewish community's reaction. It's a long section, but I think we're going to get through it okay this morning. So let's let's look at it a little bit. First, we're going to look at God's work. What did God do? Uh, That is, what, what was God's work in Paul's life? Here in verses 15, it's actually part of 15 and part of 16. And remember, Paul already started the comment. He says, but God, the contrast that everything that he had been doing and now what God's going to be doing. And so we're going to look at that here. So he gives, th- he gives these two verses and he gives three different things in these, these two verses. He gives three things that show what God did in his life. So let's look at those. He says, the first thing here is in verse 15, it's, it says, but when God who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, okay, we're going to stop right there. So first off, God's set him apart. If we paraphrase that just a little bit, it would be something like this. Oh, yeah, by the way, because this is kind of a parenthetical thought. He says, by the way, first of all, I truly believe that God in his sovereign plan had set me apart before I was born, before I was born. So what's it mean to be set apart? What's this, what's this idea of setting apart? The Greek word here is, is let me see if I can pronounce this, it's, Aphorizo, okay, and literally means to be like a boundary being set somewhere, or be separated out for something. And Paul used it figuratively, meaning destined for a purpose, a specific purpose. 
And this is quite the statement he's making because he sincerely believes in the, or believed in the sovereignty of God in his life, that God had destined him. He had picked him out to use him to accomplish his purpose even before he was born, while he was still in his mother's room. Wow, that's quite the picture of the sovereignty of God. And it does raise some questions. I, I once in a while question, have to question myself as well and, and ask myself, and you can ask these same questions. How, how do I view the sovereignty of God? How do I see it? Do I see God in complete control of my life and having picked me out as well? Or, or do we sometimes think that our lives are simply accidents? Things just go on and, and uh, they just kind of happen and they take God by surprise. I, I think that sometimes, maybe we do think sometimes that We are in complete control of what we do. God has nothing to do with it. He's just sitting up there in heaven, watching it all kind of of out of the picture. I've heard somebody say this to me recently, that that's how they they view God. And and it's kind of like, hey, when uh, years ago when I decided to, to, to become a missionary, God sat up there and he saw that and he said, well, I didn't see that coming. You think he did that? Not in your life, no. And if you think this way, you better think again on that one because that isn't the God that we find in the Scriptures, is it? God is sovereign over everything. If we, for example, if we read in the Psalms, we find that King David also believed this when he, he, he wrote Psalm 71, and he says in 71, six, he said, You are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence from my youth. By you I have been sustained from birth. You are he who took me from my mother's womb. There it is. Right there. My praise, he said, is continually of you. And Jeremiah also wrote a very similar passage. He's actually, I'm, I'm not going to read it. I'll just tell you what it said in Jeremiah chapter 1. He was listening as God was giving him a commission. And he had told him that he had commissioned him and appointed him before his birth. God is sovereign, isn't he, over our lives. And many scriptures make this very plain. All right, back to Galatians. So Paul first states here, the first thing he said was that God set him apart. God was sovereign and God set him apart before birth to be his messenger. Then Paul adds a second thing here that God did as well, second part of his work. In verse 15, he says, and he called me through his grace. So he set him apart. Secondly, he called him through his grace. And I believe he was referring here uh, part, partially anyway, to the call on the Damascus Road. He said he was called by God through his grace or because of his grace. And so Paul saw this as this, this, uh, this calling as grace, as a, as a true free gift of God that, that he didn't deserve at all. And obviously Paul recognize this, that he didn't deserve it. So let's, let's think about that just a fair second, what Paul was doing before his conversion. Remember we read there in Acts 9, Luke tells us that he was breathing out threats or threatenings and murder against the disciples of Christ. He wanted to kill them. That was his, that was his life before that. And he'd even obtained these letters from the high priest of Jerusalem to capture and to bind anyone that was following that way, the way that of Jesus that lived in Damascus. So Paul realized this. It was all about God and all about grace. God graciously intervened because he had already set him apart before he was born, and now he called him to be his servant. So we have those two things. We read there in in Acts uh, where God told Ananias to go and lay his hands on Paul so he'd regain his sight, and this was three days after Jesus had spoken to him there on the road, and it's pretty clear that Ananias was a little bit fearful <laughs> to go and, and talk to this man. He says, man, he says, this guy's. we've heard about him. He's, he's, he's going to throw us in jail. He's gonna, he might even kill us. He knew that uh, Paul's reputation as a hater of the believers, and so God then said, no. He says, go, for he's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel. So we see that, that Luke records it as well, that God had already set Paul apart and chosen him to be his servant. Then we come to, so those are the first things. Set apart, called, and now we have a third thing. At the end of verse 15, it says this, called me through his grace, and was pleased 
We need to go on here at verse 16. He was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Okay, so let's think about that statement for just a minute. Paul was pleased to reveal his son. Or excuse me, God was pleased to reveal his son in Paul. And if we, if we were, again, to paraphrase, I like to paraphrase things because it does make us understand them a little bit better. So let's paraphrase this one. He said, it pleased God or it made God happy to be able to reveal to me, Paul, who his son really was. Now, I changed the wording a little bit, didn't I? He said, in me, and I said, to me. And I think we can, we can do both of those. I think because the Greek, the Greek has this thing where it makes things a little bit different when you think about it. This, this per, preposition, you know what a prepositional phrase is? <laughs> That's grammar. I don't know if any of you teach grammar, but I love, I love grammar. So <laughs> the prepositional phrase, in me, can also be to me. And the reason for that is the little preposition en, E-N in Greek, which we've translated in often, can also be in or to or by or with. It can be all the prepositions in, in, uh, in the con- it's a co- It always is according to the context here. And so we have to understand the context. And so it makes sense to hear Paul say that on the road... While he was going to Damascus, it pleased God to reveal his son to Paul as the one all the Jews had been waiting for. So Paul saw Jesus Christ as the son of God that day on the road, the true Messiah. He saw him. And it's no wonder there was such a blinding light to see God. I don't, none of us have experienced that other than what we see in the scriptures. But Paul saw something there. And it's no wonder he fell face down in the dirt. He couldn't take it. And it's no wonder he was blinded that day. But also, what an awesome, awesome privilege when Paul recognized Jesus, instantly recognized, oh, he is who he said he was. He is the Son of God. That's awesome. And then included in, in then those three things. So let's go back over it. He said he, he was set apart. He was called. And here he says, he, he, it was revealed to him who Jesus really was. God revealed to him this. And then there's a purpose statement. Here in, again at verse 16, look at it again. He says, to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So he's explaining to these Galatian readers here that God was pleased to reveal his son to him so that, or in order that, he could turn around and then share him with the Gentiles, the Gentile world, the non-Jewish people of the world, which are most of us, if not all of us. Thank you, Lord. (laughs) I see here a bit of application too for us. I truly believe that it also pleases God to reveal himself to us as well through his scriptures in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, so that, okay, we have to carry it on. We can turn around and share him with others or so that we can glorify him, either one. But if we share him with others, I think that's part of it. That's what Paul did. What else would please God more than for us to get to know him better so that we could share him with others who he is? And that, friends, is something that pleases God. I really truly believe that. And so I'll repeat it. It pleases God to reveal himself to us in the scriptures so that we, in turn, can share him with others. This is why it's so important that we spend time in God's word because that's where we see God. That's where we understand to get to know him. God has given us his word that reveals to us who he is and what he has done. So that's awesome. That's why his word is awesome. And that's why I believe God had us translate that for the Manhui people as well, because that's what God likes. That's what pleases God. All right. So that was what God did. Now let's look a little bit about what Paul did. His next verse is 16 uh, the end of 16 to right to verse 21. 
we see Paul's travels. Where did Paul go after his conversion? I'd like to read uh, verses 15 and 16 together now, but I'd like to drop out the little parentheses so that we can we can understand the context a little better. It says, Paul said, uh, part of 15 and, and part of 16, but when God was pleased to reveal his son in me, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So I skipped some of that other stuff in there. When God was pleased to reveal his son in me, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. So Paul is saying here that he didn't go to anyone else. Okay, he didn't go to anyone else for counsel after he was converted. He didn't, uh, you could picture it. He would have gone to Ananias. Ananias is the one that, that, that laid his hand on him and, and brought his sight back. So he would have gone to Ananias for counsel, for wisdom, for, okay, what's the gospel here, Ananias? But he didn't. He didn't sit down at his feet and learn. He didn't go to the Christians there in Damascus and start a Bible study and, and begin to study and to see what he should preach on. He didn't go to anyone to get further teaching from them. In order to, so that he could better understand the gospel. Because when he, when God opens his eyes, he saw immediately. No man had to explain it to him. So this was just another way of reminding these believers in Galatia of what he had said all the way back in verse 12, where he had said, For you have heard of my former, uh, excuse me, it wasn't verse 12. I lost my point there, but where he says, The gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. It was according to Jesus Christ through his, through his uh, time spent with Jesus. Now look at verse 17 here, first part. He said uh, more. He went, uh, he went on. He said, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. He's telling these Christians here that in Galatia that, that he had made no contact with the other apostles in, in Jerusalem. He wasn't taught by them. Is what the, and you would think logically that that's where Paul would have gone because these were apostles, and they, they had the gospel message, and he could have gone to them, but he didn't. And so it's interesting, he says here also that they were apostles before me. And as he mentions this, I realized that Paul was implying something here, that he was also one of them. He was an apostle. It's just that he became one later. So we conclude that Paul definitely considered himself as an apostle, and we, we see this this often in his writings. And if we think back again, to uh, back there to Acts again, we'll go back to Acts 9. It tells us when the Lord told Ananias in a vision to go and lay his hands on Paul after this experience, we hear that the Lord said, go, he says, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, a chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel. So in Paul's own testimony of what Ananias said, he was chosen by God to be an instrument. That's a funny word, actually. Kind of interesting, the word he uses there that we get in English. The word instrument is, is translated from the Greek skios, I believe it's pronounced, which metaphorically means a man of quality. And it was used here to mean an assistant, an assistant to accomplish something. Uh, so this is an ideal synonym for the word apostle, a delegate of someone. So one who has been chosen, sent, and this is what Paul was. He was God's chosen delegate or Jesus Christ's chosen delegate. And, and now in thinking about this word apostle, it's quite interesting because I had a hard time. How do you say that in a different language when a people haven't had a background, a Bible background? They don't know any of these fancy words. They didn't even know Spanish. So I couldn't say apostole in Spanish. It had to be something that we had to come up with that meant in their own language. So as I translated that, there, uh, but going back to Acts 9 first, I, I, had it, I said it this way. Now, you get that, right? <laughs> uh, if there was somebody here that was Manhui, my wife understands it. <laughs> but translated, seriously, translated back into English, this is God saying, I chose him to be my worker, my servant, whose job is to pass on my words. And that's, that's how we were able to get into the Manhui, the idea of God choosing Paul as his man, his representative there. And then in other scriptures, and including in uh, the, f- the first verse here in Galatians, where it says, Paul, an apostle. We had to actually put it in there. And, and there I had to say, and I'll just give this one in English for you, back to, to English. He says, that one whom Jesus sent out to pass on his words, the one that Jesus sent out to pass on his words. And so in that passage, we got the idea of 
of, of the idea of him being a preacher or passing on. Uh, and we have the idea of, of that he was sent out. Uh, however, the idea of him being chosen had to be implied in that particular context, but it goes all the way through it that he was chosen. So the Imanhui don't have any problem understanding that. So we can see from these passages anyway that, that Paul was a man chosen by God to be his voice, his messenger. He was an apostle. This was his proof, his proof that he was qualified to, to uh, help the Galatian people and to straighten out their errors. And we know from his testimony that he, he didn't get this from the other apostles in Jerusalem, did he? He got it straight from Jesus Christ. Now, at more in verse 17, as we go on with Paul's travelings, what else did he do? It says there in verse 17, that he went away to Arabia, and then he returned again to Damascus. So instead of going to Jerusalem, which we logically would have thought, he traveled all the way into the country of Arabia, and finally later on he went back to Damascus, where he'd originally been converted. So uh, we're, we aren't told in this passage, and we aren't told in, in uh, Acts either, what he did there while he was in Arabia. But So I think we can safely assume that, that while he was there, he would have sought out some of those persecuted believers that he had chased all the way there. That would have been what I would have done if I had done so much damage uh, in my former life. I would have tried to make up for some of that. And I think maybe he did. But I also believe that he went there to rest and to get away from people and meditate on these Old Testament prophecies that he had always thought before meant somebody else. And now he could meditate on them, realizing that they were about Jesus. And it was a deserted place, a desert place, and there would be no interruptions and I think also he went there to listen to, to Jesus in his teaching and training him more. <clears throat> and even though Luke or, or Paul don't mention anything else, I think it's highly likely that he did receive strength from the Lord while he was there. But his point in this was of telling the, the Galatians, again, it's to emphasize the fact that he had been taught and sent by Jesus alone and nobody else. No others influenced the, this message. So this was the proof of his authority to correct the errors that the Galatians had fallen into by trying to add works to salvation. Now look at verses 18 and 19. Where else did Paul go? It says, Then three years later I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, or Paul, uh, Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. So after three years of being taught by Jesus there in the desert, Paul finally goes back to Jerusalem, which was his hometown. We hadn't been there for quite a while now, and it was three years. And he gives his purpose here. He says, I went to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, or Peter. So Paul saw a necessity to visit with, with Peter, possibly. It doesn't say uh, any reason except for one here, and I'll get to that in a second. But, but we would think, be, well, Peter was kind of like the head, the head guy, the head honcho of the disciples. So obviously, Paul would have gone to see Peter. But this is what he says. He says, to become acquainted with him. And this appears to be just a personal visit, not for any other reason. And, and, and we, we know that because of what Paul doesn't say here, I think. Paul doesn't say, so I could get more teaching, or, or so I could sit down with the apostles and, and go over what we needed to, to understand, or so that I could gain further insight so that, into the gospel message. But instead, he says, I went to get acquainted with Peter. Well, that's pretty simple. <laughs> That's all he did. And he stayed with him 15 days, he said. So specifically here, two weeks. Can't get a whole lot of things accomplished in that amount of time. And then he says, and I didn't see any other apostle except James. So why didn't he, why didn't he have a gathering of the apostles? It, it doesn't say that. All he did was to get acquainted. He had a brief opportunity to visit with James as well, Jesus' brother, and, and Peter. And for no other reason than to become acquainted and just a short visit. And, and I believe what he was emphasizing here basically was just the shortness of time. He was proving to the readers that there wasn't enough time to get instructions as to what else to, to, to uh, what the gospel should look like. That's why he says only, that's why he specifically mentioned this 15 days. And again, he was backing up this idea that he received no formal instruction other than he was taught directly by Jesus Christ. As he says there, his message was a revelation. Now, we come to another interesting verse here. Verse 20. And I had to puzzle over this one. Why is it in parentheses? 
And why is it so different from everything else? He says, now, he says, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I'm not lying. I promise you with God as my witness, he said, that I'm not lying in what I'm writing to you. Well, according to the commentaries, I had to, I couldn't figure this one out, and I had to go, which, what we should do anytime we ever have a question about God's word is look it up, look it up. Look and see what other passages say on it. And this time I, I found uh, that this was an oath he made, and it's very similar to one that we would make in a court of law where we would take and lay our hand on the Bible, and I don't even know if they do that anymore. But anyway, we'd lay our hand on the Bible. We used to and say, I swear on the Bible that this is the truth. We have to swear, make, a, make an oath or swear. And, and, and I think that's what Paul was saying here. And, and we'll see why in a second. We also see in Romans, he made a similar oath, a similar promise to the Roman believers that he was telling the truth with Jesus Christ as his witness in that case. He said in the, this letter that he promised them he really, really did feel genuine sorrow for his for his. Jewish brothers and sisters because of their need to understand the gospel and they weren't getting it. And so Paul was saying, I really, really feel sorrow and this is the gospel truth and I swear by Jesus Christ that it's true. And I believe that reason for giving that oath at that time was because he had been accused of deserting the Jews because he had been going to the Gentiles. And so they, they, they were saying that uh, they, he preferred the Gentiles over the Jews and he was preaching against them. And this comes out in his his uh, trial before Felix in, in Acts 24. We won't turn there, but just explain that, that, that this is what Paul was saying. And so why then, why then did he again, or now actually this was before the book of Romans, but why did he have to, to uh, give an oath here as he wrote them? And I believe the reason was because Paul needed to stress the fact that he'd been misrepresented by these legalistic Jews. They'd been saying all kinds of things against him. And his only truth was that he was an apostle and he had been, uh, Jesus Christ had revealed himself to him and, and that he was telling the truth. But these accusations, just go follow with me for a second. What some of these might have been sounded like. Maybe they were saying something like, look, Paul is saying that a person can be made righteous by God just by believing. How absurd could that be? Why? Why would we ever throw away our, our, our traditions and our laws that God has set up for us? We know that we have to prove we believe by the things we do, by adhering to God's laws. And we can only get in touch with God by obeying the commands and the conform to being circumcised, they said. In order to be recognized as believers, we have to become just like the Old Testament Jews. And maybe they're saying this, this Paul, he's destroying everything God demands. You can't trust him. He's perverting it. He's claiming the, he's heard Jesus Christ talk to him. Well, Jesus Christ is gone on. So how could he do that? This is absolutely absurd. He's lying just to make himself look good. I believe this is what they were saying. So Paul was calling on God as his witness that these accusations were untrue and that what he was telling them was true. The gospel wasn't about keeping the laws, was it? Or other traditions. Jesus had revealed this to him and it was important enough to appeal to God as his witness to these things. So that's, that was what the oath was. Then where else did Paul go? Verse 21. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Syria and Cilicia. A short visit there after Jerusalem, or after a short visit in Jerusalem, he went to Syria and Cilicia. And, and so I had to ask myself, well, so what specifically does this have to do with it? I believe that that Again, this emphasizes that he went far enough away from anybody to influence him. No one else taught him. But another important thing is uh, Cilicia was Paul's hometown. This is where Paul was actually born, uh, in the area of Tarsus. Excuse me, the town of Tarsus in, home, in his hometown area. We know this because of his own testimony in Acts 21 where he says, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no insignificant city. And so it's interesting to note also from the book of Acts again, and I like to go back to Acts because this is kind of like we bounce the two back and forth. We find a mention of some Jews, some other Jews who had come from this region of Cilicia. And these were men who 
were opposing Stephen when he was preaching in Jerusalem before Stephen was killed. And so these men also were from Cilicia. And, and Albert Barnes in his commentary mentions this. He says, these men that came against Stephen, he says, Cilicia, he says, was a, a province of Asia Minor on the seacoast at the north of Cyprus. And the capital of this was Tarsus, the native place of Paul. Paul was from this place and he belonged Dallas even to this very synagogue, he says. And it's probably he was one who was engaging in this dispute with Stephen. So we don't hear that said, but it's very likely that that's where he was, was doing it. So it's rather, it's very certain that Paul, or Saul as he was called at that time, took an active part in both the confrontation of Stephen and the stoning. As it says, he does, it does say the coats were laid at his feet. So he possibly was one that was actually disputing as well. And I believe that we can be fairly certain that, that, uh, that this was what, what was what, why this was important to him, to show them that, that he was from there. So he went back to his hometown after meeting. And again, we, we, I believe the point is, again, the same idea again, that it was to get away, to be far enough away from the apostles and from other influences, from Anna, Anna, Ananias and all these guys that, that had been a part of him. And he stayed away from them so that he wouldn't be influenced by them. And, it, and possibly, too, I think he worked as a tent maker there, but I think possibly he also gave the gospel to his family and, and his relatives, his friends. <clears throat> but that's something we can just speculate on, <clears throat> excuse me, because there is no record of it. Okay, now we come to the third part. So we have, first of all, what uh, happened to Paul and then his travels, what God did and what Paul did in his travels. And now we have the third part, the Jewish community's Reaction. He says here, I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. So from his own testimony, uh, we hear that the Jewish believers hadn't met Paul, had they? They talked about him, but they hadn't, they hadn't seen him. No one else had ever made contact with him. And then verse 23, he finishes this by saying, but, but only they kept hearing he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith that he tried to destroy. So they hadn't met the new Paul yet. All they had known about him was the persecutor, the evil guy. But now he had been changed. And he was now preaching the same message he had been trying to wipe off. Wow, what a change, isn't it? So now we come to the very end where we started this morning. He says, Paul says here in verse 24, and they were glorifying God because of me. And the believing Jews, they were, they were praising God. They were, they were saying, wow, he's, he's changed. They were acknowledging that it was a miracle from God, that God had changed him. And so I think we can learn from this testimony of Paul that, you know, it's true, isn't it, that God can change any man, can't he? It doesn't matter what they've done. But no man can change himself, can they? It has to be God. That's why he said, but God. And that's why he glorified God. God can change us. He can transform the vilest person, even a murderer, into a child of God. And we know this because we've seen here how Paul was changed. And we see a similar ending also of this as we look back on verse 15 where it says, but God through his grace. It's the same thing. God alone gets the praise and the glory for it. And Paul acknowledges. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it was a summary of everything that happened. But the glory only went to God. And isn't it true that God alone should always get the credit and the glory for anything that we do, shouldn't he? Whatever we do, whether we might be a former missionary or a missionary today or a Sunday school teacher or a secular worker or a boss in a job or worship leaders or, or students or teachers or whatever God has given us to do, whatever we do, whatever we plan to do, let's always remember, like it says in 1 Corinthians ten thirty one, it says, whether then you eat, and it's a little out of context, but I think it applies, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. So let's always give God the glory for anything. Never take the glory for ourselves. So I'm going to close here with Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, where it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, up beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting kootenaichurch.org.
We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.